So hello again, everyone, and welcome to today's Black History Month Lunch and Learn, Black Athletes on the Margins, I Am More. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Mahadio. I use she and her pronouns, um, and I'm the Student Development Coordinator of Intercultural Programs um, at the International Education Center at UTM. And this event today is being brought to you by the following uh, University of Toronto Mississauga departments. We have the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office, um, the Department of Recreation, Athletics, and Wellness, Connections and Conversations, and again, uh, the International Education Center. Um, so with my partners, we're all delighted to be here today in celebration of Black History Month and with you all today to talk about Blackness and athletics and the various themes that will intersect with sport and race. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope that you're all ready to be a part of this dynamic and rich conversation that we're just moments away from. Um, also, just in case you didn't know, we're going to be giving away some uh, prizes today. So there's going to be eight lucky folks who will be able to win some um, prizes from Black-owned businesses. Um, just make sure you stick around to the very end in order to qualify. You have to be present in order to qualify for these great prizes. Um, so, uh, I would now like to pass it over to Kanju Black for uh, the reading of the land acknowledgement to get us started. Hello, uh, my name is Kanju Black and I'm a program assistant at UTM's um, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Office. Um, as a Jamaican international student in Canada, my positionality amplifies the significance of acknowledging the land in which I operate. Being from Jamaica, I was born and raised on captured colonized land. Now as an international student in Canada, I live, study and work on similarly captured colonized land. I wish to not only recognize, but to appreciate and express gratitude towards this land and to those whose territory upon the University of Toronto operates and which I also reside, reside upon. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River, Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. I wish to honour the Indigenous peoples who have always been living and working on this land, and I wish to highlight the fact that this acknowledgement does not exist in a past tense, as colonialism is a current and ongoing process. As such, I intend to be mindful of my participation in neocolonial projects. Finally, I must assert that as I settle on this land, I am eternally grateful to have the opportunity to occupy this land and to be able to call it a second home. Thank you. Thank you, Kenju. Um, so I would also like to take this time to commemorate and recognize the Black and African ancestors who have fought long and hard for freedom and for justice. And I would like to celebrate their resistance and their resilience, which has afforded many of us BIPOC folks the opportunity that we have today. And we're grateful for the opportunities that they've created for this generation, and we hope to continue to create brighter futures for the generations to come. It is everyone's responsibility to acknowledge Black History Month, but I would say not just in February, but for the whole year and for every day in all times. So thank you for that. Um, and we're just gonna quickly talk about some uh, community expectations. Um, just in the spirit of community, this space was created for learning and unlearning and relearning. and. You know, today we're going to talk and delve into some really deep, um, you know, heavy, um, sensitive topics. So please remember that this is the spirit of community that we're trying to create and uphold. Um, and we are mindful that there could be security concerns when using this platform. Um, you know, if there are any major disruptions that interrupts our ability to keep control of the Zoom platform, we will then ask everyone to log off immediately. Um, also, the chat function will be open throughout the event and we would love to hear from you along the way. So feel free to pop in your comments um, or any questions that you have in the chat um, and we will get to it uh, for the Q&A portion. Um, you could also use the Q&A function that is at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions that you wanna ask to the facilitators or the panelists as well. Um, and of course, I think this goes without saying, but we encourage respectful dialogue in the chat function of Zoom at all times and any inappropriate comments or speaking out of context may result in the individual or individuals being removed. But I don't think we'll have that problem today. So, but just gotta say it. Um, so with that now, I would like to pass it over to Nightdale Baker, um, our director of the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Office at UTM for a few opening remarks. Hi everybody. Thanks very much, Rebecca. 
Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Nyfela Baker. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and really glad to have all of you in this space and really thrilled for this partnership that's come together. Um, so Black Athletes on the Margin, I am more um, really, really excited to have today's panelists uh, for today's conversation. Um, so Jesse Esiaidu, uh, a coach and former professional soccer player, Nate Adje, a Canadian football player with the Toronto Argonauts, Alicia Beckford-Stewart, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and former bobsleigh team member and national level track and field athlete will be generously sharing their experiences of athleticism and achievement in sport as black athletes about anti-black racism and the effects of COVID on their personal and professional worlds. We are also enriched today with a performance by Desiree Rubatari. I would like to extend my thanks to all of you for taking time to join today's virtual gathering. And I'm really pleased to share that a new listserv is going to be launched this month for UTM Black staff to stay connected with one another and enhance community, especially in these predominantly virtual times caused by COVID as a way to connect community and enhance connections. Lastly, I'd like to extend my thanks to Ashley Beckles, Martina Douglas, Rebecca Mahadio, and Sonia Carrero for organizing today's Lunch and Learn and at a tremendous agenda, as well as the IT team and Jermaine uh, for all of the technical support behind the scenes. As many of you may know, today is Martina's last day with UTM. I am very grateful for all, for all that Martina has initiated and contributed and led over the past few years at UTM and within the university. Some of the wonderful initiatives you're probably very familiar with are the Antio Hot Topics discussion spaces, film screening and discussions about shadism, BIPOC and Black table talk gatherings, imposter phenomenon, Black History Month luncheons like these, and even now third annual events, the business of equity, resilience through, through adversities, and a little touch of the Caribbean. Thank you, Martina, for all that you have done to be an equity and inclusion champion at UTM and at the University of Toronto. And once again, thank you all for joining today's UTM Black History Month Lunch and Learn and enjoy. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Nithela. Um, thank you for those beautiful opening remarks. Really happy to hear about that listserv that is underway. That's awesome. Okay, so it's now my pleasure to introduce to you all Desiree uh, Rubadiri, who will be gracing us with an opening spoken word piece. Um, just a little bit about Desiree. Um, Desiree's been writing for seven years. She dabbles a bit in spoken word, poetry, and prose, and is a student at UTM. She not only majors in economics, but also specializes in the economy of words. Ooh. Um, Desiree finds writing to be essential to everyone's self-discovery, and she's performed at a few open mic events on campus and currently is finding new ways to perform her pieces through videos. So really excited. Um, please take it away, Desiree. Hi everybody, thank you so much for having me. And the first piece that I'm going to perform today is called When They See Us. And it talks about the incarceration system in America. I speak in metaphors, of course, none of which you're ready for. We take the five falls, not just the four, firstly, Place your hand in front of your face. Close one eye and try to see through it. What do you see? A limited perspective. The danger of a single story narrative. Through the lace lines of your fingers. Falsified characters into unsolicited parameters of a park. All of the years that you left us in the dark. This is what happens when they see us. Secondly, this is how they had left us, inept of sympathy, criminalized by our peers, something that we continually fear. These fears became manifest in the flesh, but how would I know if all I saw was mesh, caging me from my freedom that I was promised as a child, childhood that was robbed from me, innocent stolen, abandoned, desolate. Thirdly, 
This is how they had sold us. You told stories. You sold stories, emptied of my life, as you poured into yours, profited, selling the audience your false narrative from this white fluffy pillow called privilege. Now you ask, what had become of us? We rose higher, exceeded boundaries set around us, overcame obstacles set in front of us, but money can never buy innocence, nor can it buy time. Fourthly, this is what had become of us. If you opened your eyes, if you opened your mind, if you opened your hearts, you would see that black men are suffering, you would see that black women are crying, and our black children don't even know. Fifthly, when they were with us, to Alton Sterling, to Philando Castile, to Tamir Rice, to Mike Brown, to George Floyd, to Breonna Taylor, to Black Lives Compromise, to Police Brutality, to Black Lives Lost, to Police Brutality, Kings and Queens, rest in power. Wow. Thank you, Desiree. I hope we're all giving her a virtual round of applause right now um, and some snaps. That was very powerful, very moving. And we are going to be treated to another uh, spoken word poet poetry by her later on. So stick around for that. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, okay. All right. So it's, um, it's game time. That's my attempt at an athletic pun. <laughs> um, I would like to now introduce and welcome both Martina Douglas and Akeem Briscoe, who are going to be our lively moderators for the session today. So welcome, Martina and Akeem. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. As Rebecca shared, my name is Martina Douglas. I am the program coordinator with the Equity Diversity and Inclusion Office, and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Akeem Briscoe, I'm the president of UT Mac, and my pronouns are he and him. Uh, we'll get started with introducing the panelists today. Uh, first off, we have uh, Jesse Asidui. Uh, Jesse has, for the last 10 years, Jesse has been training and developing elite level athletes, including youth, collegiate, and professional players. His company, Game Ready Athletes, has become home to some of the top talents in the country and abroad. His sublunary company, Alpha Body Fitness and Performance, also stands strong in its own right, providing the same level of expertise Jesse designed individual tailored programs for the general population that encourage not just improvement in their physiques, but also their confidence in state of mind. Holding a degree in exercise science as well over 15 years combined, competing as an elite level youth athlete and pro soccer player himself, Jesse brings a ton of practical experience and knowledge to his clients, athletes, and undeniably value to their game. Next, we have Alicia Beckford Stewart. Alicia is also a former peer of mine from high school. Brownie Secondary School. <laughs> so Alicia attended the University of Illinois Urbana, Urbana Champ is it Champaign? Is that correct? Okay, where she graduated with honors, receiving a bachelor's in science, focused in kinesiology and exercise science, and a minor in chemistry. She has competed at the international level in track and field as a hepta athlete and on the Canadian bobsled team as a brakeman. She's a strength and conditioning specialist who has acquired a wealth of knowledge through personal experience and working with a variety of clientele. Currently in the final year of her Doctor of Chiropractic program um, at Palmer College of Chiropractic, she is building her abilities inside and outside of the classroom by participating in extracurricular settings. Beckford Stewart is a campus guide, class representative with the Associated Student Government, Secretary for the Student American Chiropractic Association, Student Engagement Coordinator for Sports Council, and President of the Student American Black Chiropractic Association. Oh my goodness, that is a mouthful, and I feel tired just by reading that. <laughs> um, lastly, we have Natea Dutte. 
He, uh, Nate is a professional Canadian football player for the wide receiver for Toronto Argonauts. Nate was drafted 22nd overall in the 2013 CFL draft by Toronto, where he played the 2014-2015 season before joining the Edmonton Eskimos for four seasons. Nate was recently traded back to Toronto in February 2020. The Mississauga native played his collegiate football at City College of San Francisco and the University of Buffalo. In the midst of the pandemic, Nate launched All Ball Podcast, which features individuals as Michael Pinball Simmons, Joseph Batista, Cabe, and other and others. Provide inside look at his sent sense of who these individuals are and insights on how they're dealing with different situations in their career and community. Ooh. Awesome. So let's get started with the panel. I can't think of any like sport puns to use, so I'm not even going to try. I don't want to mess up here. Okay, so first question, folks. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why and how you got into your sport of choice? So first we'll begin with Alicia, then go to Jesse, and then Nate. Well, thank you, Martina, fellow Bramley. Uh, uh, Bramley <laughs> there, so it's awesome. So like you said, I am a Brampton native. And for myself, I've been an athlete since I was three. So I started in gymnastics. That was kind of my foundation. And then I started doing track and field when I was 10. You know, we were obliged to do cross country uh, in the snow, sleet, rain, whatever it was. And then I got into track and field that way. Uh, when I was in about grade three, I found out that you can get a scholarship for your sport. So that was kind of the intent and goal behind um, my goal setting for, for my athletic career as it started that way. And I got a, a full scholarship to the University of Illinois. And then in 2015, I kind of parlayed my talents into bobsled and uh, the pursuit was the Olympics the whole time. So nearly missed making the team in 2018. I did get to, you know, go to Pyeongchang and be a part of the whole process, but I didn't get to compete at the game. So that's still something, I guess you can say that's on my list to attain. And then now I'm just pursuing um, my degree in chiropractic. I'm out in California. So it's good morning for me as it's a uh, good afternoon for you guys. And that's just a little bit about myself and how I got into sports and athletics. Thank you so much, Alicia. So Jesse, how about yourself? That was an amazing story, uh, Alicia. I'm a fellow Bramley person as well, too. So shout out to you for your journey. Uh, a bit about myself. Currently, um, I wear a lot of hats in the sports and fitness industry. Uh, my university soccer coach at uh, Laurie Brantford. Um, I run my own athletic performance training company, Game Ready Athletes. And I'm a youth mentor to uh, young Black athletes as well, too. Um, how I got into sport, uh, youngest of five. So, you know, got competitive very early in my household and a lot of brothers played sports. I followed them whichever sports they played, basketball, soccer, track. Soccer is what stuck with me and um, it brought me around the world. Uh, I got a full scholarship to University of Baltimore, Meridian County. Um, and I went on to play semi-professional, uh, had a short career with a, a injury. And um, I'm hoping just to pass on my experiences that I've gone through as a player and now a coach and a trainer with the next generation. Nate, can't uh, hear you, you're on I'll mute. Go. There we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, uh, obviously my name is Nate J. I'm from Mississauga. How I got into my sport, um, basically played every sport growing up, uh, every single sport you can imagine, even hockey. Uh, but there was one sport that no matter what I did, I'd always be thinking about. I'd be at soccer practice, be thinking about football. I'd be at basketball practice, be thinking about football. It just gave me a feeling inside where I kind of knew it was the one. Kind of like when you when you meet your a girl or you know a guy for the first time, and you just know. So that's the feeling football gave me at, at a young age. I knew it was the sport for me. Um, I remember telling my third grade teacher that I wanted to play professional football. And my mom looked at me crazy, but I, I knew it was what what was in my heart. Uh, so I just, you know, ever since then, just did everything I could to try to make it in my sport. I uh, also did some research and found out there's almost 50 guys on the football team. So I thought my chances were, were higher to make it in football than maybe basketball, where there's only 12 or soccer, I don't know, 11, 15. So uh, that, that's kind of how I got started in my sport. I'm going on my eighth year in the CFL. 
and uh, just feel blessed every day I get to wake up and you know be a professional athlete because it's always it's what I always want to do. Go ahead, Akeem. Okay, sorry, I was muted. I forgot. Uh, thank you, Nate. That was uh, very good. Uh, we'll move on to a topic that's impact uh, probably everybody on this call. Uh, we'll talk about COVID-19 and how it's impact you guys on various levels and how it's impact your communities and how does it impact you as an athlete coach. Uh, we'll start with Jesse, then Nate, then Alicia. Thank you, Kim. Like you said, definitely, um, it's yeah, Jesse. You go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I seen the wrong screen. Yeah, definitely, it's uh, something that's affected everybody. Everyone here is uh, kind of going through it. Um, as an individual, um, it's affected me, but I think I kind of look at it in a positive standpoint. Being an athlete my whole life, from young. It just go, 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 go. And you never had a chance to like, settle down and reflect. So this time off I've used uh, productively um, just to kind of reflect and, you know, be grateful for, for my experiences I got to go through as a, as a player and now as a coach and a trainer. Um, uh, affecting my athletes, it's affecting them a lot. A lot of them youth athletes are still looking to get to the next level, whether it's a scholarship or looking to go overseas. And um, because of travel restrictions and whatnot, those things have kind of been halted. So just kind of keeping in contact with them, keeping their spirits up, you know, let them know that this is part of the journey and we just gotta be ready and prepared for when things get back to normal. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, we'll go to Nate. Yeah, like Jesse said, I, I like to look at the bright side of everything and kind of take silver linings out, obviously, uh, the pandemic has affected our sport as the CFL didn't have a season this year because of the pandemic. That was tough uh, to go through because, you know, our whole lives, you know, since probably the age of four, we've been playing sports every single year. And this was the first year I could remember where I didn't play a sport, right? But it gave me an opportunity to sit back and analyze things and, and you know, get into other things that I've been wanting to do, like media. Um, so that's, like you said earlier, I started a podcast and got into the media world myself. So, and that's led to opportunities with uh, uh, media companies in Toronto, like Sportsnet. So I'm very grateful. Obviously no one wanted the pandemic, but I'm like Jesse, where I like to look at the bright side, the silver linings and things. And it gave me more time to spend with the family. I got two little ones at home. So uh, the, the time that I've missed, you know, sacrificing playing my sport, um, you can never make that up, but this uh, situation kind of helped um, in that respect. So um, definitely no complaints. It sucked not playing, but you always have to take the, 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 the silver lines where you can get them and see the positive in, in everything. And I feel like I was able to do that this year. That's true. That's good. Uh, most people should have taken some form of positive skill or soft skills from this because their, their life kind of had to uproot and change. So that's good that you find a positive in it. Uh, lastly, we'll go with Alicia. So to kind of echo um, <laughs> our counterparts, I definitely think that um, this time gave us just like a moment of clarity to be thinking about gratitude. All of a sudden you're wondering like, I only knew how to work out a certain way or I only knew that this time of year is when I go and travel and you had to be creative. You had to find a new focus, a new goal. And I, you know, for me, I've always been a list person, goal setting, what, what's next. And um, I would say that I had to find a new way for that to be therapeutic when I'm gonna be cooped up and I don't have that chance to say, okay, I'm just going to go visit friends or go do something that could be fun outdoors when you have to be cooped up inside. So it's just a matter of just refocusing our energy and keeping our mental state just as positive as possible during this time. So it's been interesting and definitely different, but giving us some time to think outside of the box has been really nice so that we could get creative. Yeah, thank you very much. That is very true. We do have to get creative. Uh, Martina, go ahead. Thanks, Akeem. And I agree with what all of you said in terms of like just remaining positive and having a good outlook on how life is going to be moving forward and just being extremely creative and innovative in order to like keep ourselves up, right? Um, in terms of the next question, 
Nate, what is it like being a Black athlete in professional sports, um, either domestically and internationally? And how do you feel about athletes who have used their platforms to advocate for social justice issues that run in contrast to the opinions of dominant white culture? And by the way, because y'all have a copy of this, you know who goes next. So don't feel the need to wait to hear from either Akeem or myself to call on your name. Just jump right in, let the conversation flow. Okay, so I'll start off with Nate, and then after we'll move to Alicia, then Justin. Uh, that's a great question. And I feel like, you know, being black in, in professional sports, it's, it's, it's interesting because on one hand, you get a lot of support on the field, right? And, you know, you get a lot of love, you know, whether it's from your coaches who expect a lot out of you because they know, you know, more times than not, you have the abilities. Um, but you also, in the back of your head, you kind of know that, you know, if you weren't wearing that jersey or if you weren't wearing that helmet, how could things be different, right? A lot of times, you know, I, even in college or even as a professional, I have friends that don't play sports. They look like me, but they don't play sports. And they're treated, you know, very differently than I am, right? And because um, because of the abilities I have or because of well, the things I've done on the field, then it's it's unfortunate to see, right? Um, and we, a lot of times we see where, you know, that doesn't, you know, the way we're treated on the field, sometimes it doesn't translate to how we're treated off the field. You know, there are certain professional athletes you know, that are pulled over and until they, you know, tell the officer their name or they tell, you know, someone recognizes them, then it switches up and that should never be the case, right? And I've been fortunate to be a professional athlete, um, you know, to, during this time because, you know, right now the conversation around social justice has never been more prevalent, right? In the world of sports, like we've seen like guys like uh, Kaepernick, um, Eric Reed. Um, Marshawn Lynch, right? You know, they've opened the doors for the issues of uh, equity and racial injustice to be more openly talked about. You know, during this pandemic, when everything happened with George Floyd, so many of my white friends hit me up and were like, hey man, just checking on you, make sure you're all right, right? That happened so much, right? The, and, you know, it's because, you know, it was in the forefront, you know, professional athletes were, were talking about social justice issues more than ever before, right? And it opened a lot of people's eyes to, you know, kind of the issues that have been going on for years, right? So I think um, what the conversation that's happening, it's, it's, it's extremely important. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy it's happening. I'm happy to be on this panel for the conversation. And we talked about before, I mean, it is Black History Month, but it shouldn't just be just this month or it shouldn't just be when something happens to George Floyd. It should be a, a year round thing, right? So um, we, we have to, we definitely have to keep it going. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Nati. And I'll just say like, I'm, I'm curious to hear your response to this, Alicia, because I mean, you, <laughs> in terms of the sports that you've been involved in, um, specifically bobsledding, I remember seeing some pictures of you on social media and oftentimes you're the only person that looked like yourself. So <laughs> very interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's exactly right. One thing that I would say is gymnastics, bobsled, track, like all those experiences have been very, you know, very similar, but very, very different in that treatment of being the only black person in the room. Um, I could say like my first experience of really feeling different was in gymnastics and a little girl was like does your skin taste like chocolate and I was like no well you smell like marshmallows and I was like that's cocoa butter you know what I mean and it was just like little things like that that I was just like I, I didn't even really think about how that affected me or how that processed for me until later on in life but I think one thing that was really prevalent with bobsled and with track was there was this unspoken rule about being black so you should be fast and powerful you just should be it didn't matter your previous experience in the sport whether or not there was going to be a learning curve of other people that have been participating in it longer it's just well you look that way so you should be good and if you didn't perform necessarily as well as i guess they presumed you should you know perform right off the bat it was kind of like you could be disregarded very very quickly so there was a moment when you had to be thinking, do I use that as motivation or am I defeated because I didn't perform as well as I should today on the line? If I didn't you know, run the time or push the time that I'm supposed to push because of the melanin and that's all it is, it's melanin. And yes, genetically, there are certain things that, that we do have that I guess you can say are superior, but 
it really comes down to talent working hard. So it's not because you're black that you're talented. It's if you have talent, do you work hard and then apply it to whatever it is that you're doing. So that was kind of my experience with kind of every, every sport that I've been a part of that kind of unspoken rule that just because you're black, you should be good at that sport. And sometimes it's true, but <laughs> it's not always the case. Yeah, um, I've had the opportunity to be a black athlete domestically and internationally. And um, from a young age, I, I sort of always was told because I wasn't born here. I was born in West Africa, uh, born in Nigeria from Ghanaian parents. So coming to a new country, we were always kind of told that, you know, you, you have to do this much better. You have to put in this much more work. You're always going to start from, from the bottom. So I kind of always had that mentality going in and just going through what I went through in school and stuff. Uh, going through discrimination in, in sports wasn't really anything new to me. Um, not that it was accepted at all, but from being young uh, in inner city, a lot of the teams I played on were, I was the only black kid on the team, right? So they, they, they loved me because of my abilities, right? But the minute things didn't go well, then it's, oh, it's Jesse's fault or why didn't Jesse score today or why didn't Jesse pass the ball, right? So those are things that, you know, I, I experienced going through from youth level to collegiate level. Um, Internationally, it's 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 a little bit deeper. Um, I think just because in some of the countries I've been, they don't even grow up around black people, right? They only kind of see the narrative on TV, what's been portrayed by the media. So you're coming there, and it's like you're taken away from from their from their food, from their money, how they take care of their families and stuff. So at the collegiate level, youth level, you're kind of friends with your teammates, and you kind of have a bond. But then I experienced at the international level. Um, you're not really the closest to your teammates. You know, they don't necessarily really like you. They know that you guys have a job to do on the field, but besides that, there's not too much um, brotherhood that I experienced, right? So that was that was kind of tough. And um, during this time now, I, I I commend all the athletes that are that are standing um, standing up and using just using their platform to to reach out and speak about this topic. And um, like Nate said, it it shouldn't just be this month, or it shouldn't just be you know every time there's something that happened, um, this thing should have been happening. And I think we would have been further ahead if it continued um, like in the in the 60s, not to get too much into it, but during the civil rights movement, there was a lot of NBA players, football players, uh, Kareem Abdul-Dabar, Joe Brown, or Jim Brown that uh, spoke out and, you know, talked about their experiences of being a black athlete, uh, Bill Russell as well to a basketball player. But then that seemed to have stopped and then nothing would happen again until there was another incident and then same thing again, right? So I feel like from here and going forward, this should be the constant topic until things are leveled out. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, those are very three unique experience of being a black athlete. And it goes to show that not everybody has the same experience, even though we're all black, we don't all face the same challenges in the same way. Uh, we'll move on to a topic of resilience and overcoming challenges. Uh, what was the hardest challenge you faced as an athlete and what did you do to overcome it? How did you manage when you faced uh, racism in sports? And more specifically, Alicia, what challenges have you faced not only as a Black athlete, but also as a woman? So I think kind of in the, the previous question, I answered it a little bit as far as just some of the challenges of just like that presumed just talent should be good and not necessarily looking at any of your previous experiences. Um, something else that kind of comes to mind is for bobsled, it's a boys club. It is, um, it's definitely a boys club. It is a white male dominated sport. And when you go internationally, that's also what you see. Um, one thing that you'll see on our team is Recently, um, one of my fellow teammates, she switched from being a brakeman to being a pilot. And she will be the first black female pilot on the Canadian bobsled team. And so seeing things like that is, it's so encouraging, but it's something that you do not see often. So the challenges that we even face is just, we're doubted from the start and then you have to prove that you're going to be good enough and the financial burden that comes with that is probably the biggest challenge that, that I've faced going throughout 
um, high school, moving into university, it was like, well, how am I going to pay for school? Well, I probably need to get a scholarship to be able to get my education paid for. So I think it's just rising above the assumptions and using that as my motivation, been the challenges that I faced and then how I conquered those moving forward. Uh, next we'll have Nati and Jesse. So you asked like what the biggest challenge that like, you know we face in sports, and I would probably say injuries uh, are the biggest challenges you face because you know I've gone through injuries where you know I felt especially in college where you know it's my last season and you know the pros are coming up and I feel like you know I was injured I hurt my ankle and you feel like you're down you're out for the year but do you feel like you let everyone down right you have all these big goals big dreams and you know you get injured you feel you not only do you let yourself down but you know you feel like you let you know the people back home ruin for you and all your support system you feel like you let everybody down so it's a big it's a big blow for sure it's depressing you go through a lot of range of emotions and not a lot of them are positive um but, you know, in those situations, you kind of learn to take take things one day at a time and, you know, battle, the, the win the small battles, right? You know, okay, how am I going to make it through this day? How am I going to win this day and, and move forward? And, you know, once you're able to, you know, get over the initial disappointment and, and, and start to get your mind back to, you know, where you need to go, um, you know, how you're going to do it and doing it day by day, then you're much better off. That's, that's probably one of the biggest challenges you know, I've faced, uh, injuries. You know, racism in, in football is, is different because uh, it's 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 weird because football it, it's seventy percent of the players are black, right? So um, it, it's tough to say there have been racist um, moments for me that I can remember, but I just know the perception is you know black athletes are you know physically gifted but not mentally gifted, right? So in, in football, if you have a quarterback, you know that's the most mentally challenging position. They always expect him to be athletic and run around, right? And not not they can do that stuff right but you know they're also intellectuals too and a lot of time coaches don't ever and i've seen it before where a black quarterback will go into the game and a coach will you know kind of dumb down the offense because he feels like the black quarterback doesn't un won't understand all the complexities of uh offense so i've seen situations with that where that that is you know a, a little bit racist and um it can affect the guy's career because if you just pigeonhole people into um, different sections and say, oh, you can only do this because he's black, that's that's uh, very damaging. It could be very damaging and, um, and, and tough for someone to pull out of that. You also see it in when you watch sports and you see announcers say, uh, you see, if you see a white player, oh, what a smart play or, you know, what, what, a, what a witty guy, right? So you always see those little things, but for a black guy, it's rare for an announcer to say, oh, that was a you know, really smart player, you know what I mean? He'll say, oh, he was fast, or he was quick, or he was, you know what I mean? Physical traits. So I think it starts there. Uh, it's subtle. It's very subtle. And But once you start understanding it and start seeing it, uh, you'll realize it more often than not. Jesse? Yeah, similar to, to what the page said, um, my toughest challenge as a as an athlete was um, my injury, pretty much the injury that kind of stopped my pursuit of further my professional career. Um, I broke my femur, and that's like the biggest bone in your body, in your lower body, and it was a tough one to come back from. And you go through all the emotions, you know, as as athletes, where you know we're, we're we're trained, we're told, we're looked at as we're resilient. You know, we don't have those breakdown moments and stuff like that, but you know, you, you do. It's real. And you have to embrace those moments and you have to kind of dig deep and get to know yourself a little bit better, right? And you're always gonna come out stronger. So I had to just find ways of just staying positive. You know, um, I kind of developed a reading habit during that time, you know, which is about 10, 12 years now. I started reading a lot of books, just things to keep my mind going since my body was kind of at a standstill. Um, and I just kind of looked at a transition in terms of, okay, so, if soccer is going to be at its end now, like what, what's next for you? What, what is it that you uh, are interested in? And um, luckily, I, what I took in school was something I was very passionate about, um, exercise science. So, and going through my injury, I sort of use that as a, a chance to, you know, test out what I've been learning. And I, I rehab myself from that injury. And um, I came back three, four months earlier than expected. I wasn't able to play at that same level anymore. So 
I transitioned into coaching, uh, sort of just fell into my lap. I was actually just a trainer working with different clubs, different athletes, and I had a good rapport with a lot of the teams. And at the end of one of my um, programs, the parents reached out to me and said, you know, the, the kids would really love if you would join your coaching staff. And so that's, that's how I transitioned from um, turning a negative into a positive. Uh, in terms of racism, um, how I fa- managed it, um, I think I've, I've, faced, I've faced racism um, in every phase of my career. Um, as a youth player, traveling to the U.S. for soccer tournaments, um, I, when I got to about U15, U16, um, we had a predominantly, it was a colored team, right? There was a lot of Blacks, we had uh, Hispanics. It was, it was more uh, diverse team. So when we would go to the States, they're not used to that. So right away, you know, name calling would, 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 would pursue and stuff. And I mean, on the field, you, your temp, you know, your temperature gets up, but you know, you still got to keep, you still got to have proper character. You know, there's college skills watching and stuff. So we always had to carry ourselves with class, but um, I was very outspoken. So, you know, I, I would educate them. And I'll ask them, you know, like, why do you feel that you should, you should be calling me that? Like, that's not going to get me off my game. And it kind of motivated me, you know, I always kind of let my, my plane do, do the talking for me. So um, that was, that was something I experienced as a coach. I remember working with a, a club and the coach used to recruit a lot of um, inner city kids, black kids, right? And he had a very strong program. Of course, you know, we're always told that we're most athletic, we're fast, all the physical capabilities. And um, he made a comment that didn't sit well with me because somebody had made a, a comment about uh, another black player that had come from Ottawa and he didn't end up making the team. And the coach made a comment in a joking manner, but you know, it still was in no room for it where he goes, you know, I only select um, black kids from the inner city because that's they're they're used to running from cops, right? And when I heard that, I was just like, wow, like that's that that really happened. Like that's how you speak about youth and stuff. So I stepped back from that, you know. And um, ever since then, I kind of been aware of it, and I tried all my athletes that I work with. I kind of prepare them for this when they get to that next level, how to mentally be tough and don't let this uh, break you. And if you can, try to educate them as well too. Wow, I mean, all three of you shared so much and speaking to so many different themes, especially the piece around like stereotypes and how it could be so limiting and the pressures that come with that. And just I'm um, being so mindful of the differences and like nuances that come up in terms of how um, coaches may refer to black athletes in comparison to their counterparts. Um, it's crazy and seeing how that translates in the classroom as well too, um, yeah. Um, in any case, I'd like to direct the next question to Alicia, since both um, Ate and, and Jesse spoke to this. Um, have you had to deal with an injury or illness during your active season? If so, can you tell us what the road to recovery looked like for you? And did you face challenges because of the color of your skin? And of course, Ate and, as, and Jesse, if you want to jump in on this afterwards, by all means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I also noticed in the question box asking uh, whether or not um, I experience like microaggressions, racism, things like that. Absolutely, on a daily basis. And you, you develop such a tough skin towards the microaggressions that are said. And sometimes in the moment, you don't even realize that it's a microaggression. Um, one that I typically face is about my hair. So with Bob said, we wear a helmet and I like to change my hairstyles often. Um, the moment that I, you know, could do my own hair, I just, if I feel like changing it up, I do. And there was always comments about how is my hair gonna fit under my helmet? Or we could see your hair flowing behind. And it's like, you don't mention that to anybody else except for me. And it's like, why does that have to be a topic or even a conversation? But they always, you know, found a way to make it, um, maybe interesting for them or interesting for me, but I don't necessarily do it or change my hair for anyone but myself. As far as injuries, I did have some injuries in my career. I tore my ACL, um, I ruptured my Achilles and you know, through bobsled we had crashes. So there was aches and pains here and there. There was a hierarchy for treatment. Um, I would not say that it um, directly related to color of the skin at all because for the most part there was only ever three or four black people on the team at any given time so it wasn't it wasn't um any biases based on race um but there was just bias based on talent or who they deemed uh, a blue chip so that is who they deemed special 
and who was going to, in their mind, be the prize for that season or be the one that is going to be at the top of the podium. So things like that, um, they definitely help you build up resistance and resilience and you find a way to work around it. And you find, for me, I found that as motivation to just prove them wrong, that I should be the one on the table getting treatment. Um, and that was gonna be in my performance, so. Thank you. Nate or Jesse, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, it just talked to him that um, I never really had an injury when I was uh, international, but um, just in terms of, treatment wise uh being a black athlete international internationally uh being a canadian actually serves a long way i notice a lot of times just me look at my skin color my features um I'm, I'm an african and we were always kind of looked down upon when i was in europe but the moment i let them know i have a canadian password i'm from canadian or from canada then the whole conversation changes opposed to if i was from africa or even possibly the us as well too so that's something that uh, I experienced when I was away. So that was some sort of like privilege being Canadian. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I don't really um, have the same experiences because I've been international with football. I've just been to obviously the States and, and Canada and the treatment has been, especially in the football locker room has been pretty, um, I would have to say pretty, pretty great. With, compared to what these guys are telling me they're going through, I'm learning a lot. It's unbelievable. But you know, I, I could say I'm fortunate, especially being in Canada. We know things are a little bit a little bit different. But in the football locker room, uh, I can say things have been uh, pretty pretty great so far. Okay, thank you guys. Yeah. Uh, since you guys just talk about your physical injuries, I wanted to ask about how is your, how do you deal with the mental health, health aspect of it and the wellness since UTM is uh, committed to raising awareness around the importance of students talking about their mental health and wellness. Tell us what you do to practice wellness during times of uncertainty and how do you push through and prevail? I will start with Nate, and we'll go Alicia and Jesse. Yeah, that's a that's another great question, man. You're on fire today, Keem. Um, I'd have to say, man, like mental health is uh, football is something that uh, was never talked about. You know, when you're a kid, you know, and you're dealing with stuff, they just tell you to man up and and uh, you know use uh, use words like you know if you want to be a girl, go play another sport, stuff like that, right? very offensive stuff in, in today's world and would not fly today. So that's how a lot of football players grew up. And, you know, you, you learn to never really ex ex express yourself, never really talk about your feelings, your emotions. And, uh, and when you grow up, you understand that they're low key abusing us, you know, as, as, as kids, you, know, you, you, when you grow up, you understand that. And then now it's, it's harder for you to, you know, when things are going on, it's harder for you to express it because, You've been conditioned for so many years to not bring things up or not talk about how you really feel. So when DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love in the NBA came out and uh, talked about a few of the uh, a few of their issues they had with mental health, it, it was eye opening. Right. A lot of people in the world of sports saw it as you see them on the outside and you know things look great, but they're just like everybody else. They're dealing with everybody. Else. And I would say, you know, for me. Uh, a lot of the things that, that go on, I never really talked about. And until then, I really understood, hey, man, when you were dealing with this, this was going on, that was probably an opportunity you had to talk about that, you know what I mean? But you missed it. And who knows how that's affecting you now. So it's taking me, uh, you know, a lot of soul searching, a lot of, it gave me an opportunity to really look inside and understand that these kind of things affect everybody. Right, whether people are talking about it or not, whether they put it on their social media or not, they affect everybody. And it's up to you to understand that it's okay to talk about it. And it's okay, you know, I, I talk about stuff with my wife all the time, more than ever, because, you know, before you learn, you think about it, it's like, man, am I being soft? But no, I'm not being soft, I'm just being aware, right? So I, um, I, I applaud those guys for coming up because it, it gave other athletes the 
the opportunity to 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 be able to talk about these things without fear of um maybe being put down by their peers because we understand that everybody does go through it it doesn't make you any better or any less um it's just about being a, a better person and you know, for mental health issues i think it's really important that especially during these times uh, this pandemic i mean whew, everybody's going through something and it's 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 only we're only going to be better off talking about it uh, just a question to Nate. Uh, someone had asked, uh, do you think it's still happening uh, with football today? Like how kids are like forced to not express themselves and just yeah. do the physical stuff and go through? Yeah, I mean, it depends who the coaches are. I mean, if they have old school coaches and coaches that, you know, frankly, aren't very smart, it could be happening. I know in, in the States um, that does happen a lot, especially in the South where football is a culture. And it's hard for them to see past, you know, what's going on. But it's it's it's, it's a tough one because it all depends on who your coach is. If you have a coach that is super aware, like if I was a coach right now, I'd be telling all my guys, you know, if something is bothering you, tell me, right? If you know, there's no reason you know, to to man up, so to say, right? No, it's not it's not where we're at in, in culture, and we understand that that isn't the way to be, right? That isn't that doesn't make you a better athlete, like. Gerard Rosen is an NBA, right? He's got mental health stuff that he's willing to talk about. You know, he's not like you can still make it to the NBA if you talk about your mental health issues, right? It's all about your talent. It's not a weakness. NBA, it's not a weakness, exactly. So um, it's, it all depends on who the coaches are. But I feel like, you know, a lot of times uh, parents have to do a, a good job because a lot of times kids want to listen to their coaches, obviously, over their parents. So you really have to, for parents, you really have to make sure your coach's values align with yours and then go from there. Thank you. We'll move on, move on to Alicia. Um, so one thing as far as like mental health and wellness is kind of touching on the injury standpoint is we kind of get wrapped up that we are an athlete and that's all we are. And then you get hurt and that part of your identity um, or that characteristic trait, that title seems to be taken away. And you can go through the recovery process. You're seeing all your different doctors and, and they tell you that you're healed. But then that mental aspect is the last little bit, that psychological point of saying, I am able to you know, continue on doing what I'm doing and I'm going to still be successful or I'm going to be able to, to be better. And that's a piece that doesn't necessarily get touched on a lot for children as they're even figuring out the difference between being injured and being hurt. And there's a big difference. And that's something that um, we need to be able to separate because if they don't know the difference of that, it's like, oh, well, this just hurts a little bit. So I'll just keep going. And then if they're not performing as well, they're wrapped up in the performance. And now their mental health is getting ticked away because their value is put into something that they need to be doing on the field or need to be doing on the track. Something that um, I learned at a pretty young age is visualization. So visualizing and speaking it into existence of what it is that I wanna do, what my performance is gonna be. Um, seeing, you know, me and my teammates, we would sit and we'd pray, but we're sitting there right before you're about to go and it's visualize what it is that you want to happen for you and then make that happen. So daily affirmations, being, you know, grateful for your situation and, and practicing, you know, a, a gratitude journal or things like that. But your mental health is something that you should be able to talk about, but they really do tell you to put this mask on that you just need to put your best foot forward and no one needs to see what's going on inside. So I would definitely say that that's, that's something that we all deal with and you just never know when someone's lashing out or, saying something to you and just they could be dealing with something inside so it might be you know the smallest thing of just saying to someone like I see that you're smiling today but what's really going on and you know talk about their performance and talk about where they're at and just step away from the sport and step into a space of things are safe you're going to be okay and you are more than your performance you are more than anything that might be happening to you outside of this space that you're in right now Uh, that was amazing, Nate and Alicia. You guys already touched on a lot of uh, points there, similar to what I had to say. Um, in terms of the mental health aspect, you guys, as you know, we know as as athletes, we're we're supposed to be tough. We're not supposed to show that type of emotion unless it's you know within the game and whatnot. So a lot of times, kids are 
conditioned, especially football kids, as Nate uh, mentioned, because I've done some work with youth football as a trainer. And like I was like, wow, like U10, U11, U12, the way the coaches were speaking to these kids, I was like, I don't think any other sport at this age, those kids could handle that. You know, soccer kids definitely wouldn't handle that. Basketball kids, probably not. But the way they were speaking with those kids, and then you come to think like a lot of them, it affects them. You know, it affects them and they never really have an outlet to open up to. And um, when I became a coach, that's something that I, I was very aware of that I said, you know what, I'm going to kind of tap into that side of the mental part because as you know, it's 90% mental, you know, your, your confidence, once, once that goes, doesn't matter what ability you have, but once your confidence goes, it's, it's going to show on the, on, the, on the field, the court, where, wherever it is that, that you play. So I always try to keep my uh, players' confidence high. You know, I always like to know, hey, be stuck in the moment. After the moment is done, let it go on to the next one, right? You can't, you can't do a lot of things, so just keep your energy high. Like uh, Alisa had mentioned, uh, visualization, you know? That's a good way of calming you down, getting you prepared, you know, lowering your anxiety because all those things are, are normal feelings, right? A lot of times we think um, professional athletes don't have nerves. They're, you know, you're playing in front of 70,000 fans. Like, trust me, you're, you're nervous. Your heart's racing, you're sweating. You know, all those, all those emotions, you have doubts, you're thinking like your, your first pass you drop, your first shot you take, you miss. Your mind goes in a frenzy and you're like, man, this is going to be a long game. And, you know, you just got to, like, you know, take it step by step and not get lost in it because you're going to lose yourself, right? And um, like Alicia had mentioned, I got to develop that, you know, through my injury, going through my injury and really getting to see who I was besides just an athlete because once that game is gone, there's there's still a whole lot of life left in you. You, you know, most athletes by 30, if you're lucky, your, your career is finished, right? In today's world, you still got another 50, 60 years to live, so... You definitely got to um, take care of your mental health. Um, some things that I do, um, I just, I set daily goals, you know, not necessarily that I have to finish them, but just something just to keep me a purpose, give me a focus every day to say, hey, you know what, this is what I said I was going to do, keep me on that track, and you just kind of work towards those things. And exercise, you know, definitely for your wellness, uh, your, your, your body benefits from movement, and, you know, and your mind benefits from stillness. So the more your body's moving, it's going to relax your mind and, that's, that's the key to uh, maintain your mental health and your wellness. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse, Nate, and Alicia. Um, before we move on, Alicia, we keep saying Alicia and Alicia. Do you want to correct <laughs> that for, for everyone? <laughs> that's okay. It's Alicia. It's okay. Alicia. <laughs> I had it right this time. I had it right. Okay, good, good. All right. So, um, so much that you folks talked about and I, you know, the mere fact that we're, we're having this conversation around like mental health and mental wellness, we are playing a role in like destigmatizing and decolonizing like what it means um, for the Black community, right? Because it's not just for athletes, it's for the Black community on a whole um, where there is this stigmatization around like mental illness and, and what it means for us. So as I move to the last question, just mindful of time. So I'm gonna ask folks to, if we could keep it in total to just like five minutes. So the last question is, it's a two part question. What would you like to say to those who see you just as athletes and what advice would you like to leave with your fellow athletes? All right, so I'll start us off. Um, first of all, just breathe. Whenever there is so much noise around you. There's gonna be people rooting for you. And there's gonna pe be people that are not, but just embrace the journey, just breathe through it and, and really enjoy it. But being an athlete, it describes your position, but it's not who you are. It doesn't determine who you are. It is something that is empowering. It allows you to have opportunities and options to journey wherever you wanna go. There are people I'm sure that you know in your life that have never left their city but we have all been able to say we've gone across Canada, we've gone across the world. And that is a privilege that a lot of people can be afforded if they just put the effort in. And you were able to put that effort in and have people support you and live through that journey with you. But remember that is just a part of the big puzzle. And that title can be something that is manifesting and shifting into whatever you want it to be. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, don't view yourself just as an athlete. You know, you, you got to define who you are as a person, first and foremost, so that will help you as an athlete because um, it, it's a journey, you know? It's a journey that 
it's going to have a lot of ups and downs and winding roads and uncertain times where, you know, you wonder like, am I good enough? Is this for me? Right. So if you just define yourself as an athlete, you're going to carry those same emotions to everything else that you do. Right. You got to be able to separate the two. Um, and I feel for advice I would give to fellow athletes, um, embrace the journey. Um, the process is the same commitment, you know, sacrifice, hard work, dedication, all those things, but your path is going to be different, right? Your timing is going to be different. Some guys are going to get looks sooner than you. Some guys are going to seem like they're having success sooner than you. That's just how their story is going. Don't get discouraged by that. Just believe in your, in your abilities, keep working hard, keep focusing, um, and just don't focus just on your goals. Focus on the habits that are going to lead you to your goals and that'll help you develop overall as a person and an athlete. That was awesome by uh, Jesse and Alicia. Um, what I would say is um, you know, don't let, yeah, like they, like, these, like they said, don't let um, being an athlete define you. I mean, you're an athlete right now, but in 10 years, you may not be an athlete, but you'll carry with you everything you learn you know, by being an athlete, all the skills, you know, being punctual, hardworking, being determined, being able to get up when, once you've been knocked down, all those skills will follow you for life. But don't let being an athlete in that title define who you are as a person. Don't, don't walk around campus like, yeah, I'm an athlete, so I can, you know, treat people however I want to be, uh, treat them. No, you, you have to honestly be, you know, develop who you're going to be, uh, understand that, um, the sports, it doesn't last forever. Uh, there'll be one day you won't be an athlete anymore. And, you know, you have to keep going. That's life. But that's um, the most important thing is, is being a good person, um, you know, and treat every day like it's a job interview. Uh, you know what I mean? So whatever you be doing a, a day that you have a job interview, and do that every single day and everything will work out. And like Jesse said, you know, we always get into the habit of comparing, especially in sports, you compare stats, you compare how fast and how high they can jump. Like, don't do that. You know, just compare yourself with you, right? Look in the mirror every day when you wake up and ask yourself, how do I get better today? And that will take you a long way. I mean, for me, I remember being starting out football, I was like 10 years old. I was one of the worst players on my team. I loved the game, but I wasn't great, right? And then I, I'm 14, I go to high school, I'm a little better, but I wasn't the best player. But I always told myself at every level, I have to continue to work out. Well, what am I going to do today to get better? I go to, uh, I get better in high school. I go to college. I'm not the best player again. And I have to repeat that pot process over and over again, right? And, and at that stage, you tell yourself, okay, how do I get better today? And then a day turns into a week and a week turns into a year. Next thing you know, the next year, you're way better than you were previously, right? And if you do that process over and over and over again. You know, the sky will be the limit. And also I get to the pros, same story. I'm not the best, right? And you have to repeat that process every day, look in the mirror, asking yourself how you get better. And um, if you do that, you know, you, the sky's the limit, you'll have no regrets and uh, you, you'll, you'll get to wherever you're supposed to go. And, you know, the last thing is just be a good person every day. That's it, simple. Thanks so much. Ooh, we're behind time. So we're just gonna jump into the Q and A's. All right. That's cool with everyone. Who would like to facilitate this? Rebecca, you want me to do it? Um, I can jump in yep. and okay. uh, read the questions out. So yeah, thanks so much to our panelists. That was amazing, um, brilliant conversation. Kind of feel like I'm listening to a podcast here. Um, some really good points were, were made. We have some really great questions in the Q&A. Um, so in no particular order, one of the questions is, have any of the panelists ever left a team and or a sport due to racial conflict? or issues with either the teammates or coaches? And if so, um, could you explain more? Um, I can speak on that. I, I had uh, an issue with one of my coaches, uh, U15, um, sort of goes along the lines where as a black athlete, when, when things are going well, they love you. You can do no wrong. And the minute things are not going well, you're, the, you're singled out as the reason. Even though there's 18 players on a team, it's it's you guys that are that are singled out and um that was something that I went through uh, it carried on for pretty much the whole season and uh we ended up losing in the in the championship game and our coach in front of everybody singled out me and two other uh other black athletes for uh apparently not carrying the team to victory and that was like the last draw for me there so yeah 
Uh, that's an experience I had and I had to leave. I didn't leave the sport. I just went over to a different team. Wow, so unfortunate. Sorry that happened, Jesse, um, but thank you for sharing. Um, any of the other panelists want to jump in on that or we're good? Okay. Um, the next question we have, I think, might go uh, to Nate. Um, so thank you for sharing your stories and experience. It's heartening to hear that athletes are gaining greater space and opportunity to visibly talk about and engage in social justice. Um, there's still a lot of backlash about different quarters about how sports and sports people should be apolitical. Um, can you speak to how we as an audience of sport can continue to support athletes in this? Uh, that's a great one. Uh, I, I'm a little confused by the question. How can people support athletes who are you know, speaking about out, about social injustice? Is that is that the question? I think so. Yeah. How, um, I'll just repeat the last bit there. There's still a lot of backlash from different quarters about how sports and sports people should be apolitical. Okay. Um, can you speak to how like we as an audience of sport can continue to support athletes in this? Yeah. I mean, for generations the athletes were always you know told to be apolitical right the few that spoke up like the Muhammad Ali's um were, were vilified right made to look like uh villains and it's just now that it's accept being accepted right and you see you're seeing the effect that it's, it's having on society right like I said so because athletes are speaking more they're more influential like it's it's unfortunate but athletes are very influential to you know um to the masses and once the athletes are using their 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 platform and their power you know it's it's causing our counterparts our white counterparts to really look into what's been happening there i've had so many friends white friends that you know open history books and hit me up it's like hey man i didn't know this happened at, at this time and I, I can't believe i'm so sorry that are actually looking at just because maybe lebron james is talking about it right and more Whereas they would have never cared about it, right? Because um, they, they maybe they didn't have someone actually speaking about it that they looked up to. So uh, the way to support athletes is just you know, continue. When you see a LeBron James or you see a, a athlete using the platform, you know, post, retweet um, their stuff, share with your friends, right? That's a, a good way to support uh, athletes that are speaking up because there are there's backlash. Athletes are going to face backlash. It's still not mainstream to speak up well. Um, uh, uh, racial justice stuff but it's uh it's important message that's that's going on right now and it's, it needs to continue it's not something that just needs to you know it's it's cool in the moment it needs to continue for the rest of the time it's not i don't think black history month should be one one month of the year it should be taught in schools every single history class um that's available in my opinion Completely agree. Thank you for sharing your points on that. And I've been so interested in this intersection of sport and social justice, um, especially I follow the NBA, I would say the most. And I've been seeing so much in the NBA in this past year um, and have been, it's been really amazing to see the way that they've responded. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. Um, just in the interest of time, we're gonna move to the next question. Um, I'm gonna say that this could be for Alicia. How do you unpack some of the misogynistic attitudes in sports culture? Um, so one thing that kind of really stands out with that is we're not, we, we shouldn't really be comparing ourselves to, you know, men versus women, anything like that. And there's a lot of changes that are happening right now as, um, you know, rules are changing and, and cultures are changing. Uh, I saw this meme the other day after the Super Bowl that was saying, who truly is the GOAT, the greatest of all time? And it had Michael has five rings, Tom Brady has seven, but Serena has 23 grand slams and she was pregnant for one of them. And it's, it's one of those things you have to th think like, yes, sometimes there's gonna be situations when you're looking at, oh, well, a man doing this sport and a woman doing this sport, they're, they're so great at whatever it is that they're doing, but we're not really competing against each other. We're doing this for ourselves for the most part. I'm sure any athlete can think of a time when yeah, they wanted to perform for the audience. They wanted to perform for the crowd, but they're doing it for their self. They're doing it because that self-expression of feeling a purpose, feeling something that is greater than themselves. And the misogyny, unfortunately, does not just disappear overnight. It just takes everyone to do their part and not make comments like, you throw like a girl. 
to a male quarterback or, you know, saying to a woman, you're looking really buff today because, you know, they're, they're athletically built. So what if they are They're that, that judgment is going to go both ways that people need to stop making those comments and stop even having those thoughts, but it has to start somewhere. Totally agree. I saw that tweet as well, or that meme. And I was like, yes, tell them again. <laughs> um, yeah. Believe what you're saying there. I think that's really important. And um, I thank you for your comments, Alicia. Um, I think we are close to time. I'm going to take another question here. I, I think we can open it up to everyone. Do you think there's a double standard expected from BIPOC athletes to be both an athlete and a social justice representative? So for example, we don't expect Tom Brady to speak on you know, equality uh, movements. In your opinion, what is the best way to hold non-BIPOC athletes to the standard as well? Great question. Any of you wanna take it? I guess I'll take the lead on that one. Um, yeah, that, that was an amazing question, really great question. Um, I would say, I wouldn't use the word double standard, but um, I feel like, you know, BIPOC athletes really should take the lead because we need to demand change and we, we, we need to demand awareness of what's happening, right? Um, all the barriers we've broken from Jackie Robinson, Hank Aaron, everyone just getting into, the, into major league sports before they wouldn't allow black athletes at all. Even when they did get there, they weren't allowed to be on the, in the same change room, right? So. I think we do take that responsibility, but also um, white or non-black athletes should as well speak out as well too, just because they experience it with us, they see what's happening and them being quiet, you know, it, it goes a long way more negative than, than positive. Yeah, I agree with Jesse. Um, we, black athletes should definitely take the lead because we experience it, we see it, we feel it um, every day, but it means more. Like in the NFL, we saw, numerous quarterbacks come out in support of their black teammates it means more when a our white counterparts add into the fight where they talk about hey uh, I saw a few guys say hey you know I've never experienced racism I understand my white privilege but I stand with my brothers like I understand that a lot of things I have in my life are because I'm white uh, it's time for us to look past you know I know look look at what's really happening in this country. That's a lot of the uh, uh, white quarterbacks had said. And, you know, it has to be real though, right? It can't be forced. If Tom Brady doesn't feel that way, I mean, he doesn't feel that way. That's fine. Uh, I'm sure he does because, you know, he's got a, a lot of black teammates that he's played with over the years. And, you know, I'm sure they've they shared stories with them and, uh, and things of that nature, but it's got to be real. And I saw a lot, a lot of white people, white athletes come out, um, when everything went down and, um, and and add to the fight, so that was good to see. But I always, I always, it always means more when, um, uh, when when our counterparts like you can't you can't expect the people that are oppressed um, to be the people uh, front and center. It just you know it's not it doesn't mean as much honestly. And just to kind of add to that, um, it's really the intent behind the comment. So if they are supporting, it should be genuine and it should come from a place where their intent is actually genuine and not just because they should say something right. because their teammates are, are Black and they don't want to seem like um, they're going to be vilified if they say something. Oh, well, I have a Black friend or, you know, things like that. It's, it's, if the intent behind it is genuinely supportive, then we want the support. But I agree. We yeah. take the lead and... They will only, you'll only be treated the way people, the way you allow people to treat you. And they won't know that something's necessarily wrong unless you give that correction or unless you, you lead and, and guide the way to give them, um, I guess you can say the power to fight with you instead of against you. Well said, well said. And yeah, there's just so much more power in being standing as a collective and being in solidarity with one another rather than trying to fight the fight as, you know, individuals. So thank you so much Rebecca, for that. Yeah. Rebecca. Yeah, I, I, I just think about it a little bit more. It's almost the same as, you know, how we're fighting for equality for, for women, um, right? It, it, women have been fighting that fight for a long time, right? But are, are have men been listening? No, it's only mm -hmm. gonna mean something when men make it part of their own fight, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? When men take it upon themselves and say, hey, this is really wrong. The people mm -hmm. that make the laws are men, uh, mm -hmm. for the most part, have been men. 
Um, so I think it, it just speaks to the fact that it really, the only way change will happen if our counterparts take, take it upon themselves, see the fight as their own fight. Mm-hmm. And um, that's when we'll really see change. Yes, it's everyone's responsibility. Thank you so much, Nate, Alicia, and Jesse. I am mindful of the time and we are going to stop the Q&A, unfortunately, there. Um, but I just wanted to, again, thank Martina and Akeem um, as our moder- amazing moderators for today and leading this um, amazing conversation. And of course, to our panelists, Alicia, Jesse, and Nate for sharing your insights and your experiences. There's a proud mom in the chat I see. So um, I know that you're all making impact in this conversation today. Um, before we wrap up for today, remember folks, uh, there are prizes that are going to be given away in just a few moments. If you just stick around just a few more minutes, um, I think what we're going to do now though, is pass it off to Desiree to kind of lead us into a closing, uh, spoken word poetry. Wow. That was so insightful. I think I learned quite a few things from that whole discussion. So thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Um, This piece that I'm about to present to you is called Heights, and it talks about being underestimated, but still rising up as more than, and especially in honor of Black athletes in the Black community, that we need to be reminded sometimes that we are more than. So here it goes. As I arrived in this foreign land, told who I was, coerced into who I became. I'm 5'10", but most days I would stand 5'8", enfolding myself more and more into my sclerosis, embracing its crookedness like snakes and ladders, assimilating into the hunchback of Notre Dame. I guess that's how David wrote the psalm. He had to slay Goliath. But first, he had to slay the myth. The myth that he was the least of many great sons. So here comes discovery number one, that I do not have to be more palatable for you. And two, that I strive to be unapologetically me. And three, all that you see is all that you get, honey. I used to walk with my head down down but I will pick it up, down but I will pick it up, down but I will pick it up, up to where the stars are spread like champagne, champagne that I will now pop to celebrate my pain, pain that I now stand 5'10 unapologetically, six foot on most days. So if my height threatens you, let it. It is not my responsibility to come for your inadequacies. It is not my responsibility to come for your insecurities. It is not my responsibility to come for your height or lack thereof. So don't make me bend down to your level to talk to you. Reach mine. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you again, Desiree, for sharing your talents with us today. Um, Just perfect for this um, event today. Very fitting. Thank you again. Virtual applause, round of applause for Desiree. Um, Okay, I think we are going to lead into the winners now. Am I correct on that, Martina? I think we're ready for announcing the winners. Yes, let's do that. Okay, so we are using a a website called Wheel of Names to automatically generate the, um, or randomly generate the winners. Um, So if I call your name and you're still here today, you are eligible for um, a prize. It's gonna be a gift card and we will email you afterwards with more information on how to claim that prize. So let's start with the first one. Jessica Charbonero, are you here, Jessica? Yes, I think she is. Yay, Yay, okay, congratulations. Uh, We will contact you and uh, give you more information to follow up on that prize. Um, Okay, next person. Okay, Shannon. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, but are you here, Shannon? I don't think so. I don't see Shannon in the participation list. So 
Hold on a second, we have to retry. Nikki, Nikki Robichaud, are you here with Nikki? Yeah. Awesome. He's okay. here. Congratulations, our third prize winner. Anthony Sacido. He oh, was here earlier. <laughs> womp womp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, let's try again. So not Anthony, but um, Susan Lee. No, Susan? Oh no, okay. We will give someone else the prize then, no worries. <laughs> Robert Bowie. Yep. Awesome. Hi, Robert. Congratulations, Robert. Thank you. Okay, I think we're on the fourth prize now. We're giving away eight. Okay, so our next winner is Kathy Fellows. Kathy is not here. All right, let's try again. Phil, Phil Smith. Phil is here. Congratulations, Phil. All right, prize number five. Michelle Alexander. Michelle left. Oh no, I don't think Michelle is here. No, she left, yeah, she had said. Okay, it's just only increasing everyone else's chances. The, the pool is getting smaller and smaller. So um, let's next we have Anka Jess. Is Anka here? I don't see Anka. No. Tamike? Is Tamike still here? No, oh no. How about we just um, email the folks that come up afterwards based on the list of attendees that we have? Left? Sure, no problem. Okay, so then the last one would be David Taylor, if David is still here, and he is. So congratulations, David. Okay, so Martina will email the rest? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, just in the interest of time, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, but don't rest assured, you, if you won, you will get an email with a prize to follow up. Um, okay, so I think we're going to now throw it over to Zarina for some closing remarks. Thank you so much. Um, I really, really enjoyed this session. Um, and I hope that everyone else learned as much as I did. It was so nice to have everyone and have these conversations. Seeing coaches like Jesse and uh, uh, sports people like Alicia and Nate, it really gives me hope that, you know, our younger generations are in very good hands and hopefully this fight continues and doesn't just stop at February as Black History Month. So thank you so much for everyone who attended the session and um, yeah, let's continue the fight. Thank you everyone. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Have a good day.